podcast presentation. Oh, we can all see each other. Okay. <laughs> on my left is Dietrich Tickmeyer. On my right, Art Anchor, John Clark from Crime Asia, from Laxness. I can't pronounce it right. Laxness. How do you Lanxus. say it? Lanxus. Lanxus. That's a crazy name. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, well, uh, what happened now? I hope you can see us. <laughs> Would you Tap push a button there? There we go. Okay. Uh, there's some more people just came in the room. Uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, so, again, I'm Don Oshman, editor and publisher of HydeNet.com, and we have this austere group of, of specialists here on the day. Would you introduce yourself because who you are? Give a little plug. Yes, I can do. My name is Dietrich Techmeyer. I'm working since 15 years now in the leather chemical business. Uh, since 25 years in the leather chemi uh, in the chemical industry, so I have 15 years leather industry experiences, and most of the time in my career I was working <laughs> in research and development, and um, even in the last 10 years on my assignment as uh, uh, at Lanxess, I'm in charge for the innovation in in our company. Thank you, John Art. Um, I am John Clark, and I'm the uh, CEO of Prime Asia. Uh, Prime Asia is a company that operates uh, globally. We have uh, canning operations in China and in Vietnam, um, and uh, we primarily focus in the uh, footwear industry, supplying uh, other to the global footwear uh, brands. To my left is Mr. Art Anchor. I am Art Anchor. I'm the senior vice president of Prime Asia, and uh, have uh, been in the leather industry for about 47 years, and uh, almost as long as me. <laughs> and uh, am responsible for uh, raw material procurement at Prime Asia. Thank you, Art. Uh, here's let's get right into the topics. We have a group of people here, invited guests. Thank you all for coming. We didn't want to open this to the general public, but just people who were players in the industry. And we have all of you at home who are watching around the world. Some of you will wake up to this because you're sleeping there, if you're lucky. First question is on our agenda is are raw material problems turning leather into an exclusive product? Basically, is the price and, and, the, and the features of leather, uh, the cost of hides, glue, splits, What's it done to foster substitutes? In other words, are we losing market share? Leather is too expensive for too many products. Who wants to comment? Uh, <clears throat> from the brand point of view, right? From, from, yeah, from, well, from, a, from a leather supplier point of view, not from a raw material standpoint. Um, as we talk about uh, the market demand versus substitution, we have to start by thinking about what is the product that we make? What is the raw material that we provide um, for a finished good. In our, in our mind, when we talk about leather, we talk about a material that has not only unique physical properties, but also unique versatility, um, a unique elegance of the grain, and, and the foundation of the product. Um, what I would say in, in a macro sense is that it's only when this uniqueness goes away um, and the value is diminished um, that substitution is a problem. And we have seen substitution in our industry as, the, as, as costs of leather, highs, leather, um, supply imbalance, those sorts of things have taken place. But most of that substitution is, is on a commodity basis where there is an alternative that will still work for the consumer. We advocate that we try to make it more difficult to substitute by maintaining that uniqueness that leather is. So is there enough demand for people who appreciate what leather is? Is that, is that fair to say? I think that I mean, we're using up all the hides. <laughs> that's exactly right. I think it's a supply and demand scenario. We're using the hides. So is there demand? The answer to that is yes. And it's always been an exclusive or a premium product. And by its very nature, and, and as, as you just said, supply and demand will dictate the price, and, and there will always be the supply available as long as we're, we're producing cattle and eating meat, and 
there will always be demand at some level, at a price level that represents value to the consumer. Let me put it this way. Have we lost, I think we have, we lost market share because of price. You guys disagree? No, not at all. I think that I think that we've absolutely lost market share. But that said, we're using 100 percent of the market. Some segments have exactly. lost market exactly. share, and other segments have benefited. So, so there's enough consumption, yes. enough demand. That, that's exactly how I also would see this. Um, uh, there is not it's enough. There is not enough raw material available to fulfill all these increasing consumption rates for articles, for consumer articles, where either leather or maybe something else can be used. Yeah? So um, there is, that is not a demand problem. Yeah? From, uh, there is not enough uh, raw material available. So what the industry need to make sure now is that the leather remains and maybe even becomes further uh, a better a, a premium product yeah? a premium article yeah? so leather needs to focus on the premium sector and therefore and i think that's what we are talking about later as well to in order to be a premium product or substrate yeah you have to have a good process in place you have to work on your image you have to work on your standards in production management and um, this is, for me, yeah, the, the fundamentals in order to achieve this premium. Uh, premium. So, so, like leather naturally, yeah, leather, leather naturally is uh, um, is, a, is a very very good initiative uh, in order to um, to educate the um, consumers yeah? and in order to organize also a response. But that's not only done by leather naturally even from IOTCS and ICT, all of these bodies in the industry, they are lined up in the Global Leather Coordination Committee and if there comes up something in the media against leather, then <coughs> we are also always aligned and um, also with uh, leather okay. naturally to get a good response. I understand. You guys agree with that, I'm sure. Well, I, uh, my opinion is that, that there, you know, there are two separate conversations. The first conversation is, is about supply of hides, the supply of leather. Is is an industry always going to use 100% of the supply of hides? Will there be demand for 100% of the supply of hides? The answer to that is yes. The second question and the bigger question is about business and it's about operations and it's about people being able to carve out um, a, a viable business, a profitable, sustainable business using that raw material. And what we've seen is, yes, in the marketplace, for instance, certainly in our marketplace of footwear, you've seen a, a segment of footwear leather that was once grain leather turned into a, a polyurethane coating, turned into a man-made, primarily driven by cost, and in some cases driven by margin expectations at the retail level or the brand level. But at the same time, you, depending on the business models you see, you see people being able to market, regardless of cost, those hides that are available for them to purchase. So it's very important that both these, both these, these points are discussed separately. Well, let me ask you right now, going on in, in Europe, the calfskin market, you know, the products of the world bought all the, uh, a lot of tanneries, and in China, the consumption is coming down of some of these high class, high class name brands, luxury brands. And as a result, the calfskin, the gillskin market in Europe is coming down, except for just the very premium selections. So there's a limit to it, what people will pay for a leather product, right? Is there a limit? There is a limit. Well, there, there is a limit, but if you reach that limit, the cost of that raw material is going to come down. Very good point. We've good. been through these cycles before, yes. and we'll go through these cycles again. Does anybody of the assembled have any questions on this subject? You all agree? Everybody's yeah. in agreement. I've got a question here. Um, someone mentioned that um, that uh, a lot of market, market share in certain segments. Yes. What segments? Well, the luxury segment for certain. I'm, I'm you guys answer. I'm not. No, I, well, I think the question is in reference. It might have been to something that I said yes. about about footwear segments. 
there are um, there are certain segments of, of, of finished leather that um, are uh, uh, are categorized, for lack of a better word, um, by cost. If you look at a traditional um, sports shoe market, for instance, that uses a hev heavily pigmented product, that it, that can and has in many instances, not always, but has become somewhat of a commodity, which means that there are alternatives that can be used to create the exact same value in the finished goods that they are producing. Mm -hmm. And so that segment of the market, as high costs went up and the costs of, the, of leather went up, there was an alternative for that segment of the market. Thus, People switched their specifications over to either a lower grade leather or in some cases a man-made product. Let me let me bring up a subject that is not on this on the subject list. Okay? The blending of, for example, a Brazilian hide with an American hide, the finished leather. And I know one brand that says, fine, just tell us tell us what's in it, and it's okay. I mean, you can see some of this? We, because of people like you yeah. guys, you can make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Well, it's not that. We we develop a product on a particular raw material and sell that product to the, the final customer. And, and once we have a commitment as to what we're going to provide to the customer, it's not totally interchangeable. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I think that the real the, the answer to that question is that um, there are many viable raw material markets in the world today. You mentioned to Brazil, America, Australia, um, um, a, a number of others. It's not a question of what market you buy from. It's a question of matching that uh, the characteristic of that particular market's hides with what end product that you are trying to produce. As long as there's full transparency, which there is in our industry more and more today, we we try to search out and utilize the most appropriate, be it from character of the hide or to cost, the most appropriate raw material for the end product that we're trying to create. So right now, I would say more than ever, you know, you we as tanners shop the world. Um, there are still some markets that uh, do to uh, lack of regulation, some animal rights issues, things like that, um, that are untouchables. But our world, in terms of sourcing, has indeed spread out over the last certainly five, six, seven, ten years. Have you, have you guys done some of that, making things yeah. better than they were? Originally? John, isn't it in a way an art that once an article is developed based on a certain raw material, maybe from South America? Then this raw material source has to stay for this article. Yeah. Uh, okay. If it is a completely buffed article, yeah, something like this, then uh, maybe um, the raw material source doesn't matter so much. But it's not. Uh, let's say the chemistry is not there that you can make each article out of each different raw material source. Yeah. Uh, that's like you said, an article will becomes developed based on a certain raw material based on the chemicals and the, uh, and the right process and um, then we want to do the same articles from a different starting raw material actually you have to start again a new article development and that's not uh, what's going to happen uh, I guess I'd say a couple things to that I, I don't that is that is a general rule what I would say is that in today's world because of the amazing accomplishments and technology from the chemical side, from the cooperations that the tanners in today's world have with their, uh, in our case, with our raw material suppliers that do our initial tanning, um, our options for raw material have never been greater. We have, uh, we have products that are being made on, on raw materials that were unheard of 10 years ago. We have technologies that are now on different uh, grain characteristics and fiber characteristics that because of technology we're able to do now and we weren't able to do before. 
So to say that a specific product is married to a specific height source or, or to take it further, a specific chemical um, uh, vendor is not necessarily the case anymore. As a matter of fact, in this marketplace that we've been facing for the last couple of years with extraordinary costs, we as tanners around the world continue to try to find alternatives that ultimately could be used um, to create efficiencies, but not <coughs> ever sacrifice the end characteristic of the product. I have to ask this: Does the consumer have a clue? I well, I, I you know I think we do a terrible job um, in educating the, the consumers in general, and I and I don't I. I my, my thinking is that the vast majority of the consumers um, probably don't have a clue, um, and, and, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, one is education. Two is the reality of it is, is there, are, there are some spectacular um, alternatives, quite honestly, right now. There's some man-mades out there that are they're very, very good. Um, there are uh, in grains and grains and in up leathers, all those sorts of things. One of our one of our pet projects and one of our firm beliefs is that the leather industry has to do a better job educating, has to do a better job in pointing out the benefits um, and in showing the world that we can be um, a viable environmental partner as well as a viable high, uh, raw material provider for Every, not every, but a vast variety of levels of value. It segues into our next topic. Thank you, John. Uh, how can we manage issues around raw material supplies, such as disease and drought, and uh, the natural defect? Again, you guys address this probably all the time, don't you? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, chemicals are not chemicals. Uh, um, you have to have see three different classes of chemicals. You have the process chemicals, which are uh, mainly used in the beam house and uh, which are finally ending up in the wastewater. Yeah? Is, they just do a process function. So we need to think as a responsible chemical supplier to design these products that they don't uh, create a problem in the wastewater treatment plant. Then we have the finishing chemicals as a group in order to cover the, the surface. And then we have the retaining chemicals which design the character of the leather. And that is what I was referring to, the specifics for an article. Yeah, there you can't switch and say now we take another raw material and uh, uh, make the same article. So. Uh, um, yes, we have a lot of technologies, especially in the finishing technology uh, uh, in the last 20 years. The chemical industry has uh, developed a number of upgrading technologies in order to uh, start with a lower grade raw material and giving the tanning industry the opportunity to make still a high valuable article out of it. That's absolutely right and that was is one of our, let's say, uh, uh, great focus areas in the chemical industry. Doing, that's how you sell your product. Fix the tannish problem, right? Yeah, I mean, you need to compare the leather industry with other industry. In leather, roundabout for uh, the material cost, or let's say the manufacturing cost of making a leather between 10 and 15 percent roughly are chemicals. Yeah? This is in other industries completely different. Yeah? There you have in coating industry or paper industry, you have 30, 35 percent of the manufacturing costs are chemicals. Yeah? So in this industry, uh, um, there is a, a really, really tough cost pressure on, on, on chemicals. In leather, we still can focus on, on benefits like value increase for, for a tenor and we can come up with innovative ideas. That's what I personally like in this industry and I think the chemical industry has done a good job in the last it's a ripper job. And yeah. machinery guys too. Yes, of course. Yeah, we, do, we shouldn't forget that. <laughs> it's not all you. No, absolutely. Uh, you talked about <coughs> disease and, and drought. Um, I, as a tanner, we use geographical diversity as, a, as also a 
risk management are able to, if there are crises in one place, whether it's global or regional, are able to um, have tried previously certain materials that will allow us to to utilize. You allow us to utilize um, either globally or regionally um, uh, alternative raw materials, and and therefore that's how we manage these issues. It's really having tried and being aware of the materials that'll work if there's a crisis like a drought or disease in one place or another. The alternatives for us are product driven. Um, which goes back to the earlier comment, there's certain products that require certain kinds of raw materials. We, this is how we manage that issue. So, so let's say American point here. Texas deers are the most prodigious selection in America. Containers all over the world say grain isn't like it used to be. I've been here in there for 20, 30 years. I don't think it went downhill that fast. But here you've got a huge supply of hides. Next to the Brazilian, probably the biggest in the world. What do you do as a tanner? What can you do about the defects in those hides compared to what they used to be? Used to be a long time ago. You move all features. No, no. We there. If there is a crisis in the Texas area, which I you have just described, and I would call a crisis from a quality point of view, you start. And, and your raw material is, using your example, American raw material, you start moving away from the border where the, where the problem seems to be um, originating. Well, you, you, you don't know where the cattle come from. You're buying it from the factory. But experience tells us, and your comments based on experience also, that there are changes. The other thing is that it's a it's a dangerous conversation, quite honestly, to to say to ourselves as an industry, oh woe is us! You know, yeah. over the last few years, the hides are getting worse. I don't subscribe to that. What, what we have to do, what we have to do as an industry, is we have to understand what it is um, in the hand we are dealt, so to speak in terms of creating um, a match um, for the raw materials that we are able to secure. So it is our job as tanners to be able to have a menu of product and a demand against that menu of product that can utilize as close to 100% of what comes in our doors. The reality of this industry has not changed in hundreds of years. The raw material we're using is a live, breathing, eating, drinking animal. And as such, variation has been part of our game forever. And, you know, there's two ways to kind of look at it, and everyone's doing a fabulous job, in my opinion. The two ways to look at it is, A, take what you have and try to create a product against that. B, try to use new technologies um, and new advancements for upgrade systems, whether they be in retan tannages, retanages, or finishing. Or B, work on that, but at the same time, work to um, accentuate and, and, and deal with the defects in new ways of thinking as by making them part of the product that you are now trying to create. We've got a guy sitting in this room at the end of this table that's done a spectacular job thinking thinking of it that way. The problem with defect has never been that it's a defect. The problem with defect is you don't, realistically, you can never make it uniform. And so there's a lot of new thinking that can take place as you, as you think about blending those two thoughts and utilizing 100% of what you bring to the door. And, and, and there are many, many real good minds in this industry that are working on just that. And market this as an advantage. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that, again, is part time. of education. And, I, and 
we're not yeah. there yet by any stretch in terms of that sense. Yeah. But uh, what I can tell you is that a defect is not an advantage if it sticks out and yeah. you finish good that you're trying to make. If you have a defect and it's part of everything in that finished goods, maybe you have another conversation you can have with the mastering. But if any of us go buy a car, leather seating, there's a big scratch in the middle of it, or we go buy a couch and it's scratching it, we're probably looking at it closer than somebody else. But that doesn't help sell that product. I think it does to the people in this room. Yes, I, I guarantee. Yes. It is, <laughs> I guarantee the people in this room are trying to buy a couch yeah, that has another, a scratch yeah, on yeah. it, yeah. trying to buy a sofa that has a brand on it, and and this is what we have yes, to because yes. this is the value of <laughs> and the, you know the essence of the value of our raw material is just what I said. Yes. It was alive and educating the consumer. Yeah. Yeah. Right. David Peters at our last uh, forum said it used to be that. Uh, Synthetic people would try to make their product match the leather in the car. So now she says some of the tanners are trying to make their leather match the synthetics in the car. That's a terrible thing. Well, it's I hope depends, it's not true. Well, it depends on what the, where the demand is. I yes. Yes. On that same thought, can you, what do you see in the manufacturing, um, from a designer to marketing, you know, with that whole shoe complex? Do you see disagreements in this fashion? I mean, or does everybody in that company want perfect leather and you're pushing back on that? Or are some of them, some levels of that bought into this or are buying into it? I personally believe that the vast majority of the way that uh, our industry sells to, to make consumer goods, whether they're in or whatever, um, is, is not at the point yet where they are ready to embrace um, you know, the, the natural attributes of a, of a piece of leather. And I think that from an industry standpoint, instead of us saying, you know, woe is us, I think the, the challenge that we have is to, is to continue to push it and let people understand that there is a value, there is, a, there is an added value um, uh, by using leather and having a consumer be able to identify it as leather as opposed to, hey, I'm not sure what this is. In, in footwear, if you go into a Nordstrom or a store and there's a scratch on the shoe, but that shoe or that handbag is a hot product, a hot style, nobody pays attention. Yeah. Well, for, more to be that. fair, years and years, I mean, that, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of different footwear brands in this, in this, in this world, and the vast majority of have, have, excellence in terms of people on their staffs and to be fair they've done a masterful job at, over the years at identifying where certain defect can go but again the issue is it's always to try to make it the least notable yeah, notice, yeah. noticeable spot instead of embracing the fact that you know this is again what we believe is the industry to be you know a foundation material good natural defects makes a character Character. Yeah, it should be sold. It's not being sold, is it? correct? Yeah, there's been um, a move by one of the lodges which have been enhanced to sell a product which they labeled Scarface, which they uh, introduced, I believe, in Brazil at the Leathering Design Expo. Correct. And it's not so precisely what, correct. what and that, no, Mr. Clark is saying. Absolutely. At full price, not at a discount. Yeah, it wasn't full price, it's low gratitude, obviously. But I'm getting, as, as, as I've said, um, no one in this room wants to buy a a leather soap that looks like PVC. It's so perfect. You know, it's just it's just madness. Why are you going to pay two thousand, three thousand pounds for that when it, look, when it looks like something you can buy for five hundred pounds? You know, it just no sense. The consumer is not that dumb. There's a lawsuit someplace, some southern retail chain, where somebody bought a bicast sofa, and two, three years later, it's falling apart or the leather's coming off. So people learn by experience, and that's wonderful news for us. This is synthetics. I mean, this, this is, let's say, not too much the topic for, for a chemical company, but what I, what I believe is there is one, several big mega trends in the world. One big mega trend is urbanization. Yeah? I think it was in the year 2007 where more than 50% of the world population uh, now is living in cities. Yeah? And it's getting more and more and more. And um, these mega cities, they are 
built out of concrete, out of glass, and so on. And I believe this urbanization trend is very, very positive for the leather industry. First of all, people are moving much more, and then they are buying more sofas and things like this. But I also believe there comes up an increasing demand in this glass environment, metal environment for natural types of products. And even this natural type of leather article, if it is a handbag or a shoe, or maybe maybe in the next years, um, there is a psychological um, demand what the brands will, will uh, recognize that this can be pushed and that would be definitely something good for leather. Okay, hey, thank you. Let's go on to the next topic because we can get bogged down here. This is a tough question. <laughs> how, how can we ensure a greener, more sustainable supply chain? How do we address geographical areas where there's a problem? We've already discussed how we address geographical problems with a problem. What do you do? What? You don't buy it. Or you buy it cheaper. What do you do? I think that we, um, as an industry, over time, and particularly in the last decade in a way, and, and more recently than that, have given a lot more focus to the area of, of greener and sustainability. And it's, uh, I mean, it's clearly a buzzword in the industry, and more than a buzzword, it's, it's a, a focus in, in the industry um, to, to, in terms of environmental stewardship and taking the uh, the environment into consideration in, in everything that we do. And examples of this is the, are the initiatives that we as an industry support and promote, like the LWG, the, the Leather Naturally, more recently the <coughs> Ethical Leather. Um, and, and these things, I, I think, are proof of the fact that we as an industry, particularly the tanning side of the industry, is doing more and giving greater attention to um, sustainability and, and the green issues. Well, let me ask you a question again, I to John. What do the brands really want to know how green a piece of leather is? Does the consumer really want to know and put the pressure on the brands? I think that I think that uh, in this in this day and age of uh, social media and thirst for knowledge, whether it's uh, you know uh, who's sleeping with who on a reality show, or whether it's some war that's going on in the world, I think that, that the brands and consumers want to know everything. Quite honestly, I think that you've got to back up a little bit. You've got to say to ourselves as an industry that we need to do take all the steps necessary to work to bend that curve of perception that leather, the leather industry, um, can be a positive ally um, of these environmental, um, these environmental initiatives around the world. In other words, we can, as an industry, do the right thing. And we can align ourselves with people that are interested in a cleaner, more sustainable, planet. The reality is though the two things have to happen. The first thing is that we as a group, no matter how big or no matter how strong or small, have to hold ourselves accountable to that belief. And I think we as an industry, quite honestly, are, are doing a, a, a much, much better job at that. Uh, no question about it. The second thing that I think has to happen is that I believe that we must and this is, might be taken the wrong way by a lot of different people, but we must create minimum standards with no exceptions in emerging markets and around the world. We as an industry should not, should not accept people making our product unless they are held to some sort of minimal, minimum environmental standard having to do specifically um, with discharge, um, having to do with safety, having to do with uh, chemicals, having to do with everything and everything um, that is not um, reasonably partnered um, in the name of environmental stewardship. 
that's where, in my opinion, that's where we have to start. Well, what's going on? We have the big deal as a publicly thing with the Amazon. Big deal. You think there were five million cattle coming out? Yeah. Well, Amazon, which there wasn't. But, uh, but it was a big deal, and it, and and it was it was uh, it was addressed with urgency by the major players like JBS, right. and by ourselves, by brands of Nike and Adidas. There was urgency surrounding that, and as there should be, we can we can disagree about um, uh, uh, how 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 large and how short term or long term the impact may be. But the reality of it is, was there was a perception that needed to be addressed. And, and we've gone from people hearing the sound bites, understanding the perceptions, the people in our industry getting awards as to be dealing with the deforestation issues, um, you know, best in class, which is spectacular. And it, it, it has been addressed. Yeah, and Absolutely. I think that is an example, really a very good example, which should be maybe made even more public. Yeah, how good the leather industry is is organized and how serious uh, uh, the industry is taking these uh, um, yeah the, these things. I, I also would like to to say something uh, about these um, uh, terrible news which are coming very often um, about uh, yeah from these in some emerging countries. Um, first of all, I believe it is something good that there are a lot of tanneries in emerging countries because it is an opportunity for employment and um, that is what these countries need. Yeah? And uh, it's not, let's say, the solution can't be to take out the leather industry out of these countries. The solution has to be to manage these minimum standards in these tanneries. That's, that's <coughs> one thing. And we, as a chemical and so machinery uh, a supplier to the industry. We have developed a lot of technical uh, um, technologies and, and processes, uh, um, chemicals, and we make them available globally. That is not that we are not selling these technologies. We are offering this best available technology all over the world. And uh, we are educating the tenors what they have to do, how they have to do something. but. Like always, everything has its price. Our chemicals are more expensive because all this work, all these technology initiatives are priced in, in our chemical price. Now we don't take uh, a special pricing for education or so. No? This is all priced in and there are cheaper chemicals available locally, yeah, which don't have this, let's say, hidden service behind these products. And for me, the most important thing is that the leather industry, including the brands, have to get together and um, that the brands are enforcing the standards of their suppliers, but even are willing to pay the few cents which these standards cost more per square meter leather. Think about it. I mean, that's what I never understand. A shoe is in a shelf between 20 and 100 US dollars. The average manufacturing cost for one shoe is between six and ten uh, US dollars. The leather portion in this shoe is between one and two dollars. The chemicals are ten cent of this. Additional sustainability in the process maybe would add five cents in addition. I don't understand this why this is not marketable. And for a sofa, it would be not ten cents in addition. Like in a pair of shoe, it would be maybe three or five dollars per sofa. And uh, the brands need to understand this, that they are investing this and that they are requesting the right technology, but that they are also willing to make a market story out of this and educating the consumer and uh, um, selling this. That's me, what even my core message even for this uh, uh, meeting. You guys want to comment on that? I, I think that, uh, you know, as, as much confidence as I have in our industry body, I think um, our ability to uh, manage even um, one, hundredth, uh, one one hundredth of a margin percentage of a brand like Nike, literally billions of dollars, um, where that effect of billions of dollars is, is somewhat out of our reach. Well, I totally agree. There 
we need to be and continue to be um, discussing uh, the nuance of cost um, versus a bottom line accountability in our industry. I think that there are many, many ways that we can attack it. Um, but we can look at the core group of, of uh, global players in our industry. We can look at a period over 10 years through the creation of a system that created and set um, standards, measured those standards, and then elevated those standards. We can see just the dramatic change in the way that we are making leather today already. I also believe brands and the consumers are starting to understand that. And I believe that even though we're not at a point yet where every brand in the world um, will, will agree to level that plane and only buy from, uh, from some sort of accredited um, uh, supplier, I believe that the steps that we taken so far are the basis for major change going forward in a, in a very short period of time. And, uh, and I think that we need to, we will be talking about pushing beyond the global brands into smaller brands in the coming years about only buying some sort of a this, with this ISO thing that they've done in worldwide manufacturing, something that we should try to emulate? I, I think so. I don't know what the structure would work for us, but what I, again, what I can tell you is that I, I believe that there should be there should be no no excuses about allowing a tanner, no matter where they operate in the world, to to operate at below a, a, a certain level of responsibility. I don't and. and I care about jobs and around emerging markets. I care about all those things just as well. But to the consumer, it doesn't matter if it was made in, in a country that they've never heard of. The headline would still be the same. And, uh, and we need to manage that. And I believe that that is a conversation that we start with use leather and their goods um, around the world and make positive change. Bangladesh comes to mind when you say that. Yeah. And a lot of these clothing manufacturers won't buy from factories anymore. They're going to try to do something. So well they they they, they actually a lot of these guys, the clothing for the last six years since the major, major disaster that they had made positive change. Now they're actually going back in to factories that are now running very differently. Um, with, with, with new safety regulations, new audit procedures. I mean, and, and so positive things happen in that industry. No reason why positive things. Do you have any questions here on any of these comments? Just a comment. Yeah, speak loudly so that. It's just not that we have shortage of uh, substance, one we love or another. I think we need to focus on the resource shortage of this global planet that we have. And if that is something that we can educate our customers, suppliers, and our brands can lead that, I think uh, we don't need to enforce standards. Standards automatically come. One of our problems is you know, when I studied leather technology, we knew that water is something that we can use. But today, there is no more luxury of using that water that is quantity. Uh, we have energy. We have alternate energy. We have sun, wind power, but we need to use those things. It's about time we as a group, as a body, realize that there is scarcity of resources, not scarcity of animal skin. You know, historically, the demand supply has always been the same. People are eating more meat, there are enough parts. Now, with chemical industry, we're using uh, one, two, three layers of you go to a Nike store, you see a suede leather shoe. You don't see a grain finished shoe at all. Most of them are suede shoes. So we need to actually understand that the future generations are the ones who will be affected if we do not manage our resource utilization. So the standards that we should look for is say, <coughs> a square feet of leather, this is the amount of water you should use. Can we actually go to things like that, which is I think the way we should go. Isn't that up to the brand? 
the buyer, the leather buyer says, I can't use your leather because so and so forth? Yeah, but how do you actually measure it? It's uh, education and things like that. So it's there not is a measurement. There is there a measurement. Is a measurement. And, and in this industry, roughly 10 years ago, some leaders of the industry, both on the tanning side and on the brand side of the industry, came together under the initiative of the LWG, the Leather Working Group, and and there has been tremendous progress and tremendous success in first measuring and then raising the targets, which are lowering the consumption of using your example, water and energy. Um, and and the we need to market better our progress with these initiatives to those brands and those consumers who don't realize all that we're doing in that area. And that, those, are, those are a couple different things to uh, look at. I, I understand what you're saying. There's a part of me that agrees with that. There's a part of me that says that there are two conversations. The first is what we just talked about, a minimum standard of basically so that you don't hurt Second piece that you talk about is is a piece that I believe is is a part of um, a part of managing a business um, in an effective way, so that your business can indeed be sustainable, profitable, and be around as regulation and compliance issues continue to evolve, which they are. Um, and what I would say is that our challenges in the industry are A, to take the available hide source and match it up with whatever it is the product that you want to make, and B, be able to make that product in a way that you can create demand based on, based on what it costs to make. In today's world, you are not doing the things that you just talked about. You're not doing taking care of your natural resources in terms of your water utilization, your reuse purposes, your recycle purposes. You're not taking care of efficiencies in your energy use and looking at renewables, whether they be in, um, they be in the resource renewables of uh, wind and sun, or whether they happen to be different sorts of uh, uh, generation from biomass or waste streams. Um, if you're not understanding um, that labor uh, plays a role in what you're doing in terms of the, the ever-changing, uh, not only just labor costs in emerging markets, but actual availability of labor depending on where you are, the problem will take care of itself because that guy is out of business. That guy is not sustainable. So there's really two kind of uh, conversations around the that. The positive is that you know, we are moving to it. Yes, we are. But I think it's out of necessity, quite honestly. I think the people, the people that understand it, are the people that are have the maybe are are not, but have the opportunity to thrive, to take market share, to understand um, understand what the future holds. What, what do they got to do? You know, with me, this is an urgency to get these minimum standard levels rolled out in the entire industry. These topics you mentioned, they are also extremely important, but they are, let's say, a little bit midterm what we can focus on. We need to focus on on, on most important stuff. Uh, up on what, what I wanted, I just want to, to get back to this. Uh, um, what I feel is, in, in many, many, many areas, tanneries and the chemical industries are working very good together. You know, we are sitting in one boat and uh, trying to solve uh, uh, many, many problems. And it is impressive, really, what kind of achievement have been uh, implemented in the last 10 years. Um, I believe we have to get, we have to team up more with brands. That was what I wanted to say. There are things, business, of course, you, you shouldn't talk about, but um, um, the leather industry and uh, can deliver transparency and traceability. Yeah? 
but uh, there are possibilities to the final leather, if it is made with a sustainable process or a non-sustainable process, it looks the same. Yeah? And the consumer can't see this. So I believe if, uh, um, if, if we get together with the brands, yeah, there are smart ways to label a certain article, yeah, to make it visible to a consumer why he has to pay a little bit more. Yeah, uh, and um, maybe there are many other initiatives what uh, what could come up, and I believe uh, this is something um, which uh, which can speed up this so important process. And um, we have a meeting I think on Tuesday is it? Yeah, that is uh, also a, a symposium together with brands, and these are the right platforms yeah which we have to do more and. Um, yeah, I hope we can come uh, um, to, to joint uh, alignment in, in certain things. And uh, this zero discharge hazardous chemical campaign, which is even started with, uh, um, with, from the brands, I also see this positive. Yeah, that is something where we have now something where we can communicate, where we can even improve the level of sustainability in the leather industry. But that is then an initiative where Chemical industry, tanneries, and brands are teamed up. So that is the right way to go. We have another question. No question about that. And we're getting government support visibly in northern China. The Chinese government cracked down all these tanneries, dumping a fluid. Years ago, it was in Italy. They made them find made water treatment plants in Argentina and Santa Cruz. So the governments are on, on our side, and that's in a sense on the industry side as well. One other question I have for you, esteemed members here. What about the salt back? We're getting less and less high curve of salt and less salt to get rid of in the blue? Salt. Yeah. More wet blue and less salt. That's what I mean. I mean uh, uh, TDS, yeah, salt is in, in many geographic areas a problem. Yes. But I mean you also uh, need to consider in many other geographic areas it's not a problem. You know, the tannery is close to the ocean, yeah. Uh, um, there that is uh, that is not an, an environmental problem, yeah? but definitely to transport a salted hide to inter intercontinental uh, traffic, that is definitely not something which is sustainable. You know, in one 40 feet container, you can fit 700 salted hides, you can fit 2,000 wet blue, and you can fit 4,000 crust in the same container. And even from this point of view already, it makes sense to tend there where the height is uh, generated. But you think there's going to be more wet blue and less wet salt used in the enemies around the world? This is something that's evolving, but it's got a long way to go before accepts the wet blue and as opposed to the raw hides. Um, Okay, we're running out of time. I want one more thing I want to talk to you about was, and I don't know if it's any part of our industry, is the uh, knockoffs the going on. Ferragamo just made a big deal and cracked down. I don't know how many pieces of, of, of product with their name on it they didn't make. And I don't know if it's any part of our industry to do anything about that or not. I think not. But I think the labeling, like made in Italy, made in China, made in here, might help. You guys have any thoughts on it? It's just out of our room. I think, I think it's, it's a situation where technology is whether it's a piece of furniture, whether it's a car seat, but it's all about the cost benefit calculation. Brand based on based on the erosion of their business because I think we have an industry uh, I, certainly in my business I had a lot of other things to worry about before some other right. Hi, folks. I want to apologize. We had an issue of connectivity, which got about two minutes short of our scheduled the ending of the forum, and I apologize for that. 
but I want to thank everybody here in the room who uh, participated so well and asked nice questions from the floor and for attending our first live forum event. And you're going to be able to see this now on video on hydenet.com under my picture on the website on the blue tab. Most of all, I want to thank our panel, John Clark and Arthur Anker from Prime Asia and Dietrich Thiemeyer from Laxness. Without them, we couldn't have this wonderful forum and a great exchange of information and conversation. Also, I must thank Alps ALP Chemical Company from India, who made the whole thing possible. And thank you all for watching. Again, hydenet.com will have more forums. Go to the website and look at my picture and see me smiling. And click on that blue tab to watch this and all of the other forum videos we produced. Thank you.